G'day, and uh, we're back again after a short break. I had to go off and get married, didn't I? And uh, do a little bit of landscaping as well in the backyard. But now we're back, and uh, hopefully we'll be starting to put up a bit more content, a bit more regularly. So today, what have we got? We've got the 24th of September, and uh, today was the day 1942, when the Japanese forces uh, turned around and headed back along the Kokoda Trail. The uh, story of why they were forced to turn back when they were within sight of their um, objective, that's the real story. And it involves um, some of the militia units that uh, were thought that they weren't going to be any good. Um, and uh, a couple of battalions of the uh, AIF recently returned from the Middle East. So uh, without any further ado, here we go. The uh, 24th of uh, September, 1942. Yeah, so since the start of World War II, um, Australian soldiers have been overseas fighting the Germans and the Italians across North Africa, Greece and in Crete. When Japan entered the war in 1941, the 8th Division were the first Australians to face their onslaught at Singapore, and many of these men became prisoners when the Japanese army seized the island. So with troops spread across the world, who was left to defend Australia, now that it appears that the Japanese were on their way? Well, it was the militia. These were basically men of military age who didn't wish to join up and fight overseas, but could be used solely for the direct defence of Australia on Australian soil. Unfortunately for them, and fortunately for us, uh, Papua New Guinea was considered an Australian protectorate, and therefore militia soldiers could be sent there. One of these battalions would be the first to meet the Japanese troops head on, the 39th Militia Battalion. As they were only, in inverted commas, a militia battalion, they didn't exactly get first pick of the most up-to-date equipment and training resources. Fortunately, what they did have was a couple of good officers, in particular a man named Captain Sam Templeton, who made sure they were at least given some idea of military skills. So when reports reached the general headquarters that the Japanese had landed on the northern shores of New Guinea, the American show pony, uh, sorry, I mean the American general, General MacArthur, and the Australian Womble, um, Australian General Blamey, didn't really believe them to be much of a threat, because they didn't believe that they were there in sufficient numbers to do anything. Also, between the northern shores and the capital, Port Moresby, is a little thing known as the Owen Stanley Ranges. I won't go into depths about these ranges, but suffice to say, just picture long, steep ascents, knee-crunching descents, close, impenetrable jungle, and daily torrential downpours, and throw in a few mosquitoes and ticks and leeches and the whole works. Not a very pleasant place. There was one main track used by the natives to travel from village to village, and it was the only way from the village of Kokoda to Port Moresby. It was for this reason that MacArthur and Blamey didn't think the Japanese would use that option. But the village of Kokoda had an airfield which the esteemed leaders decided should at least be given a token effort of defence. Enter the 39th Militia Battalion. They were sent forward from Port Moresby to occupy the village, and it's fair to say that they were all fairly well knackered by the time they arrived, having crossed the Owen Stanleys, and were put about digging their defences. They didn't have to wait long to face the battle-hardened, experienced and well-equipped forces from Japan. On 22nd of July 1942, the first contact between Australia and Japanese troops occurred at Awala, approximately 40 kilometres from the Kokoda village. The assault alerted the main Australian force that the Japanese were on their way, and despite a determined resistance, by the 25th to the 26th of July, B Company fell back to Oivi, and eventually fell back on Kokoda. It was during this withdrawal that Captain Templeton disappeared, and never to be seen again. During the night of the 28th and 29th of July, the Japanese launched their assault against Kokoda. During the night, the men of the 39th fought hard against the Japanese and inflicted a very high price on their enemy. But as the flanking units made their presence known, it became obvious that the position could not be held. And so to avoid encirclement and imminent destruction, the 39th began to withdraw while in contact with the enemy, arguably the most difficult manoeuvre to perform in battle. Despite their dogged defence, which included the loss of their commanding officer, Colonel Owen, the 39th withdrew to Daniki, and the Japanese took Kokoda. With the loss of Colonel Owen, Major Cameron took command of the 39th and gave orders that Kokoda was to be retaken. But unlike Colonel Owen, who led from the front, Major Cameron elected to send his troops forward while he remained at Daniki, an action which was not well received by the men. B and C companies met solid resistance in their attacks on the flanks of the Kokoda village, but the troops from A Company, tasked with retaking the village itself, received almost no resistance and retook Kokoda. Major Cameron believed that because A Company were able to take the village, and B Company in particular lacked the required courage to be considered a worthwhile force, and he proceeded to tell the company so. 
Again, not well received by the troops, who had actually come up against the bulk of the Japanese forces on two occasions now, and fought well both times. Between the 8th and 13th of August 1942, the Japanese retook Kokoda and the Australians fell back to Isurava, where they would make the stand. The strength of the Australians' defence up to this point had had an unexpected bonus for the Australians. The Japanese commander, Harihi, believed that due to the amount of damage inflicted on his troops, the Australians must have had a force of at least 1,500 to 2,000 troops in the area. Because of this, he delayed his next assault to allow time to bring in sufficient troops and stores to repel this large number of troops. In actuality, by this stage, the 39th had been reduced to only about 400 exhausted men, and if General Harihi had decided to maintain the momentum, chances are he would have crushed the 39th and continued his advance. Instead, the 39th were given a precious two weeks to properly prepare the defence of Isurava. The Battle of Isurava was fought between the 26th and 31st of August. Again, the battered men of the 39th Militia Battalion bore the brunt of the opening assaults. This time, however, they were much better prepared, as their new commanding officer, Ralph Honor, had set the best defensive strategy available to him. Honor was a distinguished veteran of the fighting in North Africa, and the men of the 39th immediately recognised a calm and efficient man who knew how to fight a war. The battle for Isharava can best be described as a series of frontal assaults by the Japanese and desperate defence from the Australians, although again this is a gross oversimplification. Attacks were sent in at various points around the perimeter, searching for potential weak spots, and then wave after wave of attackers would then attempt to break through. The 39th held on, despite being merely 400 men up against around 3,500 Japanese. To make matters even more precarious, the Japanese had managed to bring a mountain artillery gun and mortars into action, pounding the Australian position before the infantry attacks. Inevitably though, the overwhelming odds began to tell, and during the night of the 26th, Ralph Honor estimated that they could hold out for only a few more hours at the most. He organised for about 30 wounded men to be evacuated and prepared the remaining men for a do or die defence. Then, along the track from Alolo, a line of soldiers came towards the 39th. But they weren't Japanese, they were the forward elements of the 2nd 14th Battalion coming in to relieve the survivors of the 39th. During that night, more men of the 2nd 14th entered the battleground and took up positions which were held by the 39th. The battle still hung in the balance though, and Ralph Honor knew that every available soldier still fit to handle a rifle would be required. And so he offered the commanding officer of the 2nd 14th, Colonel Keyes. The 53rd Militia Battalion was tasked with holding a parallel track which would take the Japanese around the Isarava battlefield and allow them to attack from the rear and trap the defenders in their own perimeter. The 53rd's performance was less than stellar throughout the campaign, but in fairness they were poorly equipped, they only had one obsolete Lewis gun from World War I, and poorly trained having received only one week of actual combat training before being sent to meet the Japanese. Although some sections did provide some form of resistance, their general failures under pressure had to be expected. Fortunately, hot on the heels of the 2nd 14th and the sec came the 2nd 16th and they were immediately dispatched to the side track where they were more successful at keeping the Japanese at bay. At Isharava, the fight continued over the next few days with the Japanese throwing more and more men into the attack and finally they achieved a breakthrough. It was only a couple of soldiers but it was evidence that the defensive position was weakening and more and more penetrations were made. At one point, the word that the perimeter had been broken reached the headquarters staff. One soldier who overheard the news was Bruce Kingsbury. He immediately jumped up and jogged down to the breach. Upon arrival, he noticed a mate of his with wounds to the arms and legs, but still fighting on, and immediately Kingsbury picked up the Bren gun and charged into a group of Japanese troops massing to exploit the breach. Firing from the hip, Kingsbury, Kingsbury accounted for around 30 enemy, while the remainder scattered in the face of this wild Australian. As he took shelter behind a rock to reload, a solitary Japanese sniper fired a shot, which hit Kingsbury in the chest, killing him. Due to his actions, though, the breach was sealed, and the perimeter held. Kingsbury was awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross for his actions. The desperation of the fight led to other examples of the courage and devotion of the troops. The 30 wounded men which Ralph Honor sent back were being treated at the rough hospital when news of the situation reached them. They had done their bit and had every justification in continuing their trek back to the safety of Port Moresby and proper medical treatment. Instead, 27 of the 30 men simply picked up their rifles and equipment and headed back to the fray. Despite these acts of bravery, it soon became apparent that Esurava could not be held, and so Brigadier Potts began making arrangements to withdraw to the next defensive position. It was either that, or continue fighting to annihilation. The first area to be considered was at Myola, where stores had been dropped by air and held before being carried forward to the troops. However, it was quickly obvious that the position 
was, un, was indefensible. Not that this fact seemed to worry Blamey from the comfort of his Brisbane headquarters, where he insisted that the Japanese forces be held at Myola. Fortunately, Brigadier Potts, probably destroying his future in the military, ignored the obviously impossible order, and a much better position was chosen on top of a steep hill known as Mission Ridge, with an even bigger hill behind it which became known as Brigade Hill. Having selected the area, the order to withdraw were given and the defenders of Isharava began to pull back. Through a series of leapfrog moves, the 39th, 2nd 14th, 2nd 16th and 53rd militia moved back, each taking their turn to dig in and provide the rear guard while the other units moved through. The Japanese were continually forced to fight for every yard of the track, receiving ambush after ambush of their leading units. These delays again proved beneficial to the Australians while increasing the hardship of the Japanese. Each day that the Japanese advance was delayed was an extra day the Australian wounded had to move away from the danger area. It was also another day where the Japanese troops were exposed to the jungle, weakening their strength and consuming their meagre supplies. It was during this advance in reverse, no one ever called it a retreat, the 3rd Battalion of the 21st Brigade, the 2nd 27th, arrived and finally, after nearly two months of physical strain, poor food, malaria, little sleep and severe fighting, the 39th Militia Battalion were finally relieved and the approximately 120 survivors of the battalion were pulled out of the fight and sent back to Port Moresby to recover from their ordeal. Their vital contribution has largely been overlooked by the general populace to this day. Now the responsibility of stopping the Japanese fell to the 2nd 14th, 2nd 16th and 2nd 27th battalions of the AIF. The newly arrived 2nd 27th took position at the point closest to the Japanese with the 2nd 14th and the 2nd 16th occupying the flanks. Brigade headquarters was located, strangely enough, on Brigade Hill. The Battle of Brigade Hill was fought from the 6th to the 8th of September. The Japanese managed to haul a mountain gun onto the opposing ridge and began lobbing shells at the Australian position. The Australians on the other hand had nothing to respond with and so just had to sit and wait. Having learned from their experiences in attacking the Australians so far, the Japanese used a slightly different approach. While their advance units attacked head on, the flanking units pushed around the sides as was their standard practice. But on this occasion, the flanking forces worked their way further to the rear and managed to occupy the track between the battalions on Mission Ridge and Brigade Headquarters on the hill. Attacks were ordered from either side of the Japanese breach and approximately 20 men set out from both sides to shift the enemy. They knew it was tantamount to a suicide mission, but they also knew the track needed to remain in Australian hands if there would be any hope of holding the Japanese. The counter-attack succeeded, but only half a dozen of the attackers survived. All too quickly it became apparent that the position could not be held, and so once again, reluctantly, Potts ordered that the arrangements to withdraw be commenced. Australian casualties mounted, and the surviving members of the 2nd 14th and 2nd 16th, having only been involved in the fighting for a couple of weeks, were now so decimated that they had to be formed into one battalion. The order to withdraw had been given, and the composite battalion began to move back. The 2nd 27th provided the rear guard, and at one point when a group of Japanese soldiers were seen massing for an attack, Six men charged forward in the manner of Bruce Kingsbury and scattered the terrified Japanese before returning to the perimeter and gaining precious minutes for the rest of the troops to pull back. Unfortunately, the 227th had been cut off and Brigadier Potts held on as long as possible, hoping to see his battalion emerge from the track. But they never appeared and the time to fall back himself had arrived. Shortly after, Brigadier Potts was ordered to return to Port Moresby. Technically, it was so that he could explain the situation to those further back, but everyone knew that when a commander was withdrawn in the middle of a battle, then he had effectively been relieved of his command. The man who had led the remarkable defensive action for weeks had to now face the music from men who had never seen the front line. The brigade fell back to prepare for positions at Iori Baiwa, but it was soon became apparent that the position was too exposed, and so a further withdrawal was conducted to the... As when the Japanese troops arrived at Iori Baiwa, in the distance, they could actually see Port Moresby and the ocean behind it. They were so close, they felt that victory was within their grasp. They successfully crossed the Owen Stanley Range, but the cost had been enormous. Initially, it was intended for the crossing to take 10 days, but the stubborn fighting with the, by the Australian forces had dragged that out to over six weeks. They had planned on seizing food and other stores from the Australians in order to supply themselves throughout the advance, but the Australians either took their stores with them when they left, fell back or destroyed it. If they couldn't do either of these, then they made sure the food left behind was tainted, causing sickness amongst the Japanese troops. General Horihi knew his troops were exhausted, and while looking down on Port Moresby with his goal in sight, he received orders from the Emperor himself to withdraw. 
and on the 24th September 1942, the Japanese began withdrawing from Iorubaiwa, back along the track on which so many lives had been lost. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you want to be advised when uh, new episodes are posted, just click on the subscribe button that's down there somewhere. Uh, if you want to find out what I'm up to, go to my website, warwickoneal.com. Uh, if you want to check out my blog site, it's uh, notyouraverageidiot.net, where I blog on all sorts of things from four wheel driving, single parenting, whatever comes into my head. So I hope to hear from you soon, and uh, cheers. See ya.